Hello, and welcome to the Computing Conversations column. This column is from the July 2013 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled, Katie Hafner, The Origins of the Internet. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column, and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan. The ARPANET was quietly decommissioned February 28, 1990. The modern Internet, with its speed, graphics, and video, might make its precursor seem like a dusty antique from a much earlier age. But today's Internet owes a tremendous amount of success to the research done while building the ARPANET. Back in 1993, Katie Hafner, then a Newsweek reporter and co-author with John Markoff of Cyberpunk, Outlaws and Hackers on the Computer Frontier, decided to write a book about the ARPANET's history before it disappeared forever. I recently interviewed Hafner about 1996's Wizards Stay Up Late, The Origins of the Internet. Hafner became involved in the book project on the recommendation of friends. As the work progressed and its scope expanded, her husband, Matthew Lyon, became involved in the project. There was this whole world of, of coders and uh, hardware guys in the 60s, and I thought to myself, I bet there's a really interesting story here. So. My editor at Simon & Schuster was totally 100% behind it. Uh, we, the working title was really bad. It was called Building Cyberspace. So we knew we needed a new title. And so, and Matt, my late husband, didn't come in on the project. Uh, he was actually a, a better writer than I am and a wonderful, just had an absolutely incredible mind and could grasp anything. And. Uh, he didn't come in on the project until about maybe a year into it. When I was getting overwhelmed, I had this new baby and I was working um, at Newsweek uh, and I was, uh, and I realized that there was just more to the story than I could do myself. It would have taken me like double, double the time. The book research took over three years as Hafner visited with and interviewed key members of the ARPANET team. One of the most amazing things was uh, visiting um, Larry Roberts, who was um, running IPTO at the time that this whole thing was drawn out. We were at his house in Woodside and we went out into the garage. This is how unresearched this topic was, because, you know, who'd have thunk, right? And uh, we go out into his garage and there are all these boxes of old mildewy papers and he starts pulling them out and they're old letters between him and people at MIT and uh, then he pulls out this amazing set of sketches of him just, it's like, remember when um, Trudeau, Doonesbury did Inside Reagan's Brain? This was like inside Larry Roberts' brain. He was like just sketching out all the possible configurations of um, what this network could look like. And I just loved finding all this incredible primary source material. And it was a, it was, uh, I felt like I should have been paying somebody to be able to do this. She started visiting Boston, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles, and attending various Internet Society and Internet Engineering Task Force meetings and conferences. Well, the research took a couple of years, okay. and it wasn't so much driving. That The hacker book was like driving all over all over the place because that was three different stories of three different hackers. This was more, in fact, email between the hacker book and this book and the and Wizards, so 1988 and like when I started this book, 1993, email had come, it was much more popular. So there were a lot of, we did a lot of emailing back and forth. I spent a lot of time, I did go from, I was living in Austin at the time, I did go from, um, uh, Austin to Boston a lot, and I spent a lot of time, actually, I did fly to L.A. One of the ARPANET's leaders with whom Hafner spent a lot of time was John Postel, inventor of the domain name system. Uh, and he died in 90, I, I want to say 98, 99, and that was shocking. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him. Tell me about it. Um, Tell me about John. Well, John, uh, so anyone who's ever seen a picture of John, Maybe you have one you can dig up. He had this very long, kind of Santa Claus-like beard. And what's amazing is, so I spent a lot of time at his house. He lived in a teeny, tiny little house in, uh, in the L.A. area. 
and uh, with his girlfriend, this very nice woman named Susan. And uh, on the refrigerator, there were all these family photos, and they all, they were all like these uh, people with long beards, long white beards. <laughs> I thought, what an interesting family. And he drove, I think, this kind of beat up Volvo or something like that, uh, you know, something completely unpretentious and lived so unpretentiously and, uh, and had all his files like right in his study in this little house, all this history, and also at ISI where he worked in Marina del Rey. And, uh, and we spent hours and hours and hours together, first in Boston, um, at where we were both at a, an anniversary party of the, um, of the ARPANET. And we spent a lot of time together and I thought, you know, this guy is key. And he was so quiet that sort of getting him to open up really meant spending a lot of time with him. And he was, oh, and we met at one of the very first INET conferences in 1995 in Hawaii and spent a lot of time there. And he just was so patiently trying to explain to me um, things. But I'll never forget this one thing that happened with him in Hawaii at the INET conference. It's um, the Internet Society conference, one of the very early ones. And, uh, and I just was asking him some questions and he goes, uh, he, he looked completely uh, disturbed and distracted. And he said, no, no, there's someone over across the room I have to talk to. And it was someone from a very small country sort of wanting to talk to John about their domain, the country's domain name or something. But to John, it was far more important that he deal with this person's problem than, you know, then cement his place in history, in this ARPANET history. In fact, when I was working on the book, um, I sent him an email. I'll never forget this. I think I don't have the email anymore. And I said, just out of curiosity, why haven't you ever like wanted to get rich? Because that's when people were just starting to get rich. So this was in 95. Yeah. And he said, it just, that's just not what this is about. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It is. Yeah, and that's who John was. I asked Hafner why she thought the mainstream computing and networking companies effectively ignored the ideas behind the ARPANET for such a long time. Well, you know, Paul Barron had happened. He had couldn't convince AT and T to build the the very uh, marvelous network that he uh, designed, and uh, then these other guys, the next guys, the next crew that came in. Uh, and they just, they were very, very, you know, think about it back then. It was, they had a monopoly. What did they really care? They had, um, they had the um, Bell, uh, Bell Research. Research Labs. Yeah. And they, it, it was a not invented here kind of syndrome. And they, they didn't see, they didn't see it. I mean, talk about no vision. They simply didn't see it, but I think the fact the not invented here part of it was um, like, what would we need? Uh, what would we possibly right. need this for? Yeah, they were in a context. They were in their own context, yeah. yeah. But thank goodness, I mean, thank goodness they didn't get their hands on this thing. Yeah. The same with IBM. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. you know, just yeah. we don't we didn't want corporate America or deck or deck for that matter. Um, the original hardware was um, based on a Honeywell machine, and thank goodness Honeywell doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it sounds terrible that I'm saying this, but it's but it was all, all kind of happy, accidental sort of coincidences. Another issue is the role of government in creating the funding and policy conditions to allow work like the ARPANET to exist and thrive. I asked Hafner how she saw Al Gore's place in the history of the Internet. Every time I tell people I wrote a history of the origins of the Internet, um, people say very mockingly, oh, did Al Gore invent it? And I won't play into that. He I played a huge role in terms of policy and direction. When Clinton was running for president, you know, they were out there with this very important technology white paper that... Uh, I mean, you can't do things like this unless you have um, the support that people like Al Gore provided. We in the computing profession are often far too quick to drop last year's model and replace it with next year's shiny toy. We forget the moments when a technology truly was breakthrough 
and instead focus on its later iterations, which are naturally more polished and widely used. Books like Katie Hafner's Where Wizards Stay Up Late do a wonderful job of capturing these breakthrough moments close to the time when they actually happen. Thanks to her and other writers like her, when we finally realize the importance of these breakthroughs many years later, we can go back and learn from those who made them. This column is from the July 2013 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled Katie Hafner, The Origins of the Internet. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan.